In March 1918, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was signed between Russia and Germany, ending the war and leaving the Entente powers in despair, while Germany felt like they had won the lottery, suddenly feeling victory was within reach. Germany could now transfer all their forces from the Eastern Front to the Western Front, where there were 194 divisions of Central Powers, compared to the 181 divisions of the Entente Powers. At this time, German railways were running at full capacity, with trains full of soldiers coming from the east. The general staff estimated that it would only take a few weeks for the German forces on the Western Front to reach 230 divisions. In command was General Paul von Hindenburg, but actually in charge of the operations was General Erich Ludendorff, chief of the general staff. Ludendorff felt that the forces were sufficient to launch an offensive, so where should they attack? He chose the Somme region, intending to break through and capture the strategic hub of Amiens, which would divide the British and French forces. The Germans had high hopes for this offensive, which they named the Kaiserschlacht, believing that victory was certain under the protection of the Kaiser. At 4.40 a.m. on March 21st, thick fog blanketed the Somme, visibility reduced to 10 meters. Suddenly, the British soldiers in the trenches were visited by some unexpected guests, a dozen German soldiers who had escaped from the other side. After interrogation, they said that the Germans were about to launch an unprecedented offensive and they didn't want to die, so they had come to warn them. They asked for prisoner of war treatment and guarantees of their safety. The news was immediately sent to General Hubert Goff, commander of the British Fifth Army stationed there. Goff was skeptical, but decided it was better to be safe than sorry, and to take the initiative. At 3.30 in the morning, the British began shelling German positions and rear transportation points, but there was no response from the other side. This was very unusual. Generally speaking, when one side starts shelling, the other side will definitely counterattack immediately. But the Germans were so quiet that they seemed to have disappeared. At 4.40 in the morning, the shelling suddenly fell on the British positions, from the front-lying trenches to the rear for more than 10 kilometers, all kinds of transportation lines, communication points, and barracks were destroyed. The front-line positions were the most tragic, with shells so dense that each British soldier could get 10 shots on average. When encountering shelling, it was skillful to dodge shells. Many inexperienced new recruits didn't understand that when they stood against the wall of the trench, a shelling could shake them to pieces. Many people were bombed to madness and split their minds on the spot. After five hours of shelling, the German trenches sounded the charge whistle. It was still the assault team that took the lead. At this time, the assault team had a unified name, the Sturmtruppen, and was uniformly equipped with assault rifles, submachine guns, and flamethrowers. This assault rifle is worth mentioning. What is an assault rifle? It is a light, flexible, fast-firing weapon with a short range. Such weapons are particularly suitable for close combat. The Storm Assault Team was equipped with the world's first assault rifle, the MP-18. This weapon has taken the close combat capability of the Storm Assault Team to a new level and has been called the Grim Reaper in the trenches by the British. Under the cover of thick fog, these assault team members cut through the barbed wire with pliers, approaching the British line like ghosts. A large number of British soldiers who were bombed into a daze found that the assault team members in gray uniforms suddenly rushed out of the fog and were taken prisoner before they could resist. The defensive line of the British Fifth Army was quickly pierced by the Germans. At 3.30 in the afternoon, Goff was forced to order a full retreat, and after a day of battle, the Germans had advanced 10 kilometers, causing nearly 20,000 casualties to the British. This was already a considerable achievement in World War I. The British quickly asked the French for help, saying, Buddy, you gotta help me out here, but the French said no. Why not? because recently Paris had been attacked by an unknown weapon and there was a huge explosion in some place suddenly. Every 20 minutes or so, many people were killed. French experts inspected the scene and said that the metal fragments looked like some kind of shell, but at that time Paris was far behind and the nearest German was more than 60 miles away. At that time, the range of heavy artillery was generally only 20 miles, so the French felt that the Germans must have developed some new weapon. 
Sure enough, this new weapon was the latest three-barreled gun made by Germany, known as the Paris Gun. The Paris Gun was built by the famous Krupp military factory with a caliber of 211 mm. Its original design was to bombard Paris from a very long distance, so the range reached an exaggerated 75 miles, about 120 kilometers. In order to achieve this range, the Paris gun needs a huge barrel, which stands about 12 stories high and weighs 180 tons alone. This long barrel cannot support its own weight no matter how good the steel is, so there must be a huge bracket underneath to support it. The whole gun weighs 375 tons and is placed on a special train. However, the Paris gun has a long range but poor accuracy. The shells fell everywhere in Paris. So the French said to the British, look, our capital is being bombed now. No way. We can't help you. We have to defend the capital with all our strength. The British said, no way. We can't hold on anymore. In the end, we have to die together. So British Prime Minister Lloyd George quickly brought the wartime cabinet to France to meet French Prime Minister Clemenceau to discuss it. Finally, an agreement was reached. First of all, the Entente powers needed to form the Western Front Command. After four years of war, the British and French forces still hadn't unified their command, but now they finally did. Who would be the commander-in-chief? It had to be Marshal Foch of the French army. As soon as Foch took office, his first order was to send French reinforcements to Amiens. Paris being shelled didn't matter. It was a big deal if the line was broken. Once the reinforcements arrived, the British stopped retreating. It was no longer so easy for the Germans to attack. The stormtroopers were elite, but they suffered heavy losses, especially among the veterans. The new recruits didn't understand the principles of infiltration warfare and often turned small infiltrations into personal charges. In addition, something else had a great impact on the Germans when they were looting. They found a lot of food, including chocolate and champagne, which were luxury items at the time. The German officers had always told the soldiers that the British were finished and that our submarines had strangled them. But now the German soldiers saw that the British had an abundance of supplies. The German soldiers couldn't take it and went crazy eating and drinking, refusing to advance again. No one believed what the officers said. But Ludendorff didn't know any of this. He thought they could still attack and even split the forces in two, one to Amiens and the other to Paris. As a result, both German forces encountered fierce resistance. As the attack until to April 5th had yielded no results, Ludendorff had no choice but to order the German forces in the Somme direction to take a break and redirect their offensive towards the northernmost part of the front, the Lys, aiming straight for the British Expeditionary Forces supply bases of Calais and Dunkirk. On the defensive side were the Portuguese and Belgians, who were usually just doing logistical work where had they seen such a large attack. So it didn't take more than 10 hours for the Germans to break them. The British rushed to reinforce them. The two sides then engaged in the first tank battle in human history. A dozen British whippets and Mark IV tanks encountered a few German A7 versus. The A7V was the first tank produced in Germany, and its main feature was its large size, with a crew of up to 18, a 57mm gun and six machine guns. Its armor and firepower were much stronger than the British tanks. So when the two sides met, the British tanks found they couldn't penetrate the enemy's armor and had to retreat. The German tanks chased and fired, and in the end nine British tanks were destroyed while the Germans suffered no losses. Seeing Calais and Dunkirk in peril, British Commander-in-Chief Haig issued an order. There was no other way out but to fight to the end. Every position must fight to the last man, and no retreat was allowed. He then said emotionally, We are confident that our cause is just. The safety of our homeland and the freedom of mankind depend on your persistence. It was reminiscent of Lord Nelson's famous words, England expects that every man will do his duty. This order boosted the morale of the British forces, and they fought fiercely. The two sides then engaged in a tug-of-war. A few days later, the Germans had no choice but to retreat after failing to advance. Like a gambler with red eyes, Ludendorff decided to go all in for one last attempt. 
This time, the target was Paris. On May 27th, the Germans broke through the French line and once again reached the banks of the Marne, only 37 miles away from Paris. Foch sent Pétain, the French commander-in-chief, to find General Pershing of the American Expeditionary Force, hoping to ask for help. At that time, the American forces in Europe had reached 500,000, but only four divisions had completed their training, two of which had already been sent out. After consultation, Pershing agreed to lend the remaining two divisions to the French to fill the gap in the line. The American 2nd Division had just arrived at the front when the German attack came like a tide. The Americans lived up to expectations and repelled wave after wave of German attacks under fierce machine gun fire. The last attack was driven back by a soldier named Hoffman alone. At that time, 12 German soldiers with machine guns crept out of the bushes. Hoffman shouted and rushed out alone, stabbing two German soldiers to death. Seeing the situation was not good, the other German soldiers ran away. Hoffman was seriously injured, but he survived in the end. Later, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. This battle was the first time the Americans fought the Germans head-on, and the first time Americans participated in such a large-scale war since the Civil War. Before that, the Americans had bullied the Indians, Mexicans, and Spaniards, to be honest. This time was a real fight. It can be said that the American soldiers passed the test. The German attack ended in failure. After that, Ludendorff launched two massive offensives in an attempt to capture Paris or encircle it, but to no avail. Then the Allies began to counterattack. By August 7th, the Lions had been restored to their march positions. After four months of the Kaiserschlacht, it was finally over. This battle saw over 700,000 Entente Powers casualties, with the Germans not far behind it, 600,000. It was a draw, but the Entente Powers had the advantage of having the Americans, plus Africans, Indians, and even Vietnamese as reinforcements. The Germans had no such luck, and all their casualties were bona fide Germans. You could say the Germans bled for this battle. With so many dead, disease was rampant. As the weather got hotter, measles, typhoid, and cholera ran rampant in the trenches. With the filthy conditions, rudimentary medical care, and high mortality rate, it was a nightmare for the Germans. To make matters worse, a new virus called the Spanish flu had started to spread. With no medical care like we have today, the spread of infectious diseases was unchecked. Countries were decimated, with some divisions losing over 20% of their men. For the Germans, it was the last straw. Loyalty among the troops was waning, as they realized that all the fighting and dying was for nothing more than a few extra chicken legs on the aristocrats' dinner tables. To make matters worse, news of a dire situation reached Ludendorff's headquarters. In mid-June, the Imperial Ministry of Agriculture reported that no corn would be available until spring of 1919. The troops would have to make do with potatoes, and not even enough of those. The Navy reported that the Entente Powers were sinking less than 250,000 tons of shipping per month, down from the peak of three quarters. The Navy was unable to stop the Americans from bringing in troops and supplies to the Entente Powers. By the end of June, news from the Italian front line reported that Germany's ally, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, had been defeated by Italy and was already considering a ceasefire with the Entente powers. At the same time, the Ottoman Empire was also defeated, and the British and Arab forces were advancing into its heartland. On the other side of the Balkan front, the Entente powers had assembled more than 500,000 troops, while defending the line were only two German corps, with the rest being Bulgarian forces. A few months ago, Ludendorff, who had launched the Kaiserschlacht with great confidence, now looked at the map in horror and found that the world situation had changed drastically. Germany was now in danger of total collapse. Ludendorff had no time to clean up the aftermath of the failed Kaiserschlacht, and the Entente powers launched a massive counterattack. Subscribe to my channel and the next video will continue the story of World War I.